Just a minute to get everything situated. I believe y'all have already heard the gospel this morning. That was excellent. So powerful. Such a, a strong image, I think, that we will keep with us. The word of God may be too heavy for this stand. <laughs> uh, by 10.15 when the service lets out I should have everything together and ready to get uh, as I thought about what to give you this morning several things came to mind I think there's a lot of things that we could teach but this morning I have a confession I have nothing for y'all in fact, this morning has nothing to do with what I have at all. It's about what you have for me and for everyone. Um, oh, I forgot something else. Andy, Andy, click. Okay. Um, it's been said that what is accepted today will be expected tomorrow. Or that what is accepted by this generation will be the standard for the next generation. My dad always tells people around election time, don't vote for you. Vote for your children and your grandchildren. And when you vote, think about what kind of nation you will leave them. So what kind of nation are we leaving today? I want to say a little bit about this nation. On July 4th, 1776, the United States of America drafted a Declaration of Independence from the tyranny and oppression of England in order to establish the freedom for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It's interesting they phrase this, rights endowed by our Creator. In September 17, 1789, the Constitution of the United States was signed, forming a democracy like never before in this world. In 1791, the Bill of Rights was added, guaranteeing such freedoms as religion, speech, press, 
and in Craig County, everybody's favorite, the right to bear arms. In 1865, slavery was abolished. And in 1870, African Americans were guaranteed the right to vote. And then in 1920, women were guaranteed the right to vote. Do you see how amazing the freedom is in this country and what we have? America has led the way in the world of what freedom means, and most people will never get the things that we have. I think it is fantastic, and it's such an opportunity for us. However, in 1962, prayer was taken out of public schools. And the following year, in 1963, Bible readings were taken out of the public schools. And they were both a result of a Supreme Court decision. In 1973, and we touched on this this morning, it became a mother's right and choice to have an abortion. I want you to know that since then, about 57,940,690 abortions have been carried out in this country. That's a huge number that I can't even comprehend, so back here. So to put that into perspective for you, it's estimated that all American service personnel killed or wounded since the American Revolution is estimated to be about 2,852,000. The population of New York City, which is the most populated city in the United States, is about 8.4 million. We're talking 57 million abortions. In 1994, Don't Ask, Don't Tell became the policy for homosexuals in the military. And in June of 2015, the Supreme Court is going to decide whether the government will recognize homosexual partners as entering the institution given by God of marriage. <laughs> Where have we landed and what have we become? We lead the world. We have so much freedom. But as you can see, I think this country and this world is headed in a moral decline. What is accepted yesterday is expected today. It seems helpless, and what can we do and how can we be a light to the world? I think we find a similar situation that we're facing in Titus. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Titus chapter 1. I'll start reading with verse 15, and I think we have it on the screen. Yeah, uh, skip down to where it starts, to the pure is where I'll start. Um, to the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny it. Does that sound familiar? Being detestable and disobedient and worthless for any good deed. And continuing with verse 1. But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Uh, to give you a little background of this, Titus was left in Crete by Paul to set up the church there. He was to appoint leaders and elders and get the church going. Paul specifically instructs Titus of one tool that he is to put within the church there. And I think that same tool there will work for us today. And I want to say this. <laughs> we can change the world by employing the biblical tool of mentorship. It is so powerful. It is not clicking. This is not so powerful. There's something on the screen. Oh, it is not on. Is it the rule of thumb to throw technology? Well, someone push that for me. change the world by employing the biblical tool of mentorship. Mentorship is that older people teaching younger people everything they have to offer. It's so powerful, and we're going to look at that this morning. And I think there are three aspects of mentorship into which we will look. The first thing is to look at yourself. So Titus was to teach the older men and older women who would be the mentors. Just for the fun of it. Uh, mentors are not necessarily by age, but they're by experience and by maturity. So, I don't know how you feel about yourselves this morning, but we're going to do a little test. So, 
Raise your hand and keep it raised if you have any grandchildren. Wow. Now you might lower it because it might get uncomfortable if you keep it up too long. Any grandchildren. Okay. Raise your hand if you are married or you have ever been married. Wow, look at that. Okay. Raise your hand if you've ever had a job, anything you've been paid for, any kind of work. That's a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever been in school, whether it's homeschool, private school, public school here at Craig or anywhere else. Ever been to school? Wow. Keep your hands up for just a second. That looks like just about everybody, just as I thought. You can put them down. You know what this means? Everyone has some experience by which to mentor those who do not. So, everything we're going to cover this morning applies to you as potential mentors. You might not raise your hands ever again in church, I ruined you, but you volunteer to be mentors. <laughs> um, so we start with instructions for older men. This is not working. Uh, we start with instructions for older men, so I'll go ahead and read verse 2 if you haven't followed along with me. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. The first thing that we are giving instruction to is older men are to be temperate. Now this word, ah, here we go. it literally means to, be, to abstain from alcohol like the temperance movement, temperate. But even more so, it means to have a pure mind that's not intoxicated. So simply put, he must be level-headed and thoughtful. The next thing is worthy of respect. He's serious when he needs to be, and people, people understand that he means business when he needs to. He's someone that people can look up to. The next thing is self-controlled or sensible. And this also means to have a pure mind. But even more so, it means a humble mind, you're calm, and you have balanced judgment. So, simply put, his attitude must be consistent. And the last thing is, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Now, sound means pure or uncorrupted or strong or healthy. So, he's, he must be strong in faith, which is how he loves God, how he trusts God. And the way he trusts God will be demonstrated in his life. Next thing is love. How he loves those around him, whether it's his family, or friends, his wife, and even strangers. How he loves. And then the last thing is endurance or perseverance. A man is a witness by how he sees things through, how he finishes things. So these three things must be healthy. So he must be a strong and healthy example of faith, love, and endurance. Alright, next we're going to move on to the instruction for older women. I have to be careful this morning when I don't say old women. I say older women. <laughs> but I do want to say for you ladies, you age like a fine wooden instrument. You sound better and you look better over time. We men age more like a fence post. <laughs> so these women were also aged. They had gained the wisdom and experience that comes with living. And so it's, I'll go ahead and read verse 3 to follow along with me. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. Likewise means that everything that applies to the older men also applies to the older women. Uh, the first thing that women are to be, older women are to be is reverent in their behavior. This is a fascinating word in the rich language as I was looking at it. We've talked about becoming a temple here, that together we're being built into a temple of God and in different ways we can serve Him. This word literally means becoming or being fit into a temple. So, older women must become a temple. The next thing is not slanderers or malicious gossips. We know slander is to talk falsely or, or cut someone else down. This can be done on Channel 7 News or in the privacy of a conversation. Regardless, it is so harmful. So how do you speak about other people? Do you find it easier to build people up? Or do you find it easier to tear people down? Think about that. The next thing is not addicted to much wine. <laughs> um, I've heard people say that, well, I'm not addicted to much wine, I'm just addicted to a little. <laughs> and that's not exactly what this means. I think if you're addicted to any, it's too much. 
An alcoholic never drinks too much. He drinks just enough. But little leads to much. And remember, just as the older men, older women must have a pure mind, not intoxicated by bad influences, much beyond mine. And the last thing is what she teaches must be good. Women demonstrate their wisdom by what they teach, and if it's good, then it shows their maturity and ability to be a mentor. Uh, so let's look at some similarities and differences. These qualities apply to both older men and older women as well as all Christians, and more specifically to everyone here who raised your hands. All these qualities apply to you. Now, there are some things, just real quickly, that are specific to the genders. I think the different words that are used serve as warnings. The first one to older men, I think it's so dangerous for men to be disrespectable. And what I mean is, I think it's our greatest fear to come up short, to be a failure. And if we allow our actions to get us to be that, to be a failure, how can we serve other people if we don't feel confident in ourselves? For women, I think, uh, between where it mentions wine and slandering, but women, I think we can all admit, are more social people. I'm sure we can all remember our moms talking on the phone for hours. <laughs> uh, and I think it's a great thing, and it's such an example of the way we should be. We should be very social. But... When those social needs are not met, it's very dangerous for a woman to look for other ways to fill those needs. The example is of alcohol, but it can be anything that fills your life. And the other thing, slander, it's easy to talk bad about someone to fit in with someone else. It's easy to compromise your character to fit in, and that is so dangerous. Now after we've looked at ourselves and we've put ourselves in order, then we must look to others. I don't mean that we have to reach a certain level of perfection in order to be able to pour into others' lives. Because I think sometimes the greatest testimony we have are how we're learning to deal with struggles we're facing now, to identify with people. But once we have, I do say that we must maintain our spiritual lives in order to be able to pour into others. We must start with us. But once we have, we must look to others. So let's take a look at the mentorship for young women real quick. I'll continue reading with verse 4. So that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Here is the power and the usefulness and the necessity for older women to encourage younger women. I know that sounds so simple, but that is so necessary. Older women teach and encourage younger women. The first thing uh, is to teach them how to love their husbands and love their families. This only comes from the example of an older woman. <laughs> you teach them how to be a good wife, how to be a good mother. You teach women what it means to love their husbands and children by the way you love and care and work and sacrifice. And I know there's so many examples of that today, the people that are here, the way that you sacrifice for your family. It's fantastic. You must teach older women how to be self-controlled and sound-minded, just as uh, everyone else is to be. Um, the other thing that's huge, you teach young women how to be pure. Purity, a man just cannot teach like a woman can. And I mean purity in two aspects. The first is modesty. Teaching a young girl how to dress, how to be in public, how to present herself. And the second is chastity, how she acts and the deeds that she does. Purity in those areas, you all have to pass on to the younger generation. The next thing, oh, so teach them how to become a temple of God and be pure in a filthy world, just as you are. The next thing is busy at home. Now this is my first sermon as your youth minister, and after I read this, quite possibly my last. <laughs> no, as a matter of fact, I want to say this is not woman's sole calling in life, or that all a woman is good for is to work at home. No. But I think this emphasizes the importance of you holding the family together, and you only learn that through the example of older women. You learn how to love your husbands and love your children hands-on and practically. The next thing is kindness. Uh, I think kindness is a virtue, it's a mark of all older women that, that are mentors. And I think about Miss Kathy. She just emanates kindness. That's the kindness we're talking about. 
The next thing, if the last one didn't do it, then this one will. Subject to their own husbands. <laughs> uh, by the example of the interaction between older women and their husbands, younger women learn how to trust, how to submit to their husbands. And I do want to clarify what this means is that a woman trusts her husband that, she, that he will love her like Christ loved the church as it talks about in Ephesians 2. So she trusts that just as Christ loves the church and would do the best for it, her husband will do the same. And then the trick is to give him the authority to do that. To trust him and then give it over to him to do that. They learn that, older women, by your exam. So when a woman is properly mentioned, mentored, and living godly, the world will not be dishonored or mocked. In fact, what you pour into younger women glorifies God all across the world. You make an example. Next is the mentorship for, for young men. Here's the power and the usefulness and the necessity for older men to encourage young men. Once again, it's that simple, but it's that important. Men, we need you to teach young men what it means to be men. We're given a few things here. Uh, I'll continue reading with verse 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. In all things, show yourselves to be an example of good deeds, with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. Hmm. Young men must be taught how to work for God, how to do good deeds, how to serve. Older men must teach young men how to have a good reputation, how to be a light in the community, how to be a leader in the community. They must teach young men how to make good choices and do good deeds. Show them the mistakes that you've made and the things you've been through so that they don't do the same. Also, older men must teach younger men how to talk. And I think this is emphasized pretty big here. Their speech must be beyond reproach, which means it doesn't need any correction. What they say is good. And I don't mean their grammar's perfect. I mean that, that what they say is of good quality. They only learn that by older men. In all areas of how you talk, whether you talk here with your church talk, or you talk with your grandmother, or your parents, or whether you talk out in the community, or whether you talk with your friends, or by yourself, when you're mad, or when you're upset, or when you're hurt, or when you're laughing. Does your language glorify God? That is.